Hi there. I wanted to do a quick introduction before I move on to my lengthy rambling videos on how to make and how to play flutes. Uh, I'm Lily Wilcox. Uh, I am one of the flute makers at Stellar Flutes. My father, uh, Tom Stewart, is the other flute maker. My father and I work together every day making flutes and flute making kits like the ones that you, your group is going to work with. Uh, my father is 80 years old now, I'm 33 years old, and he has macular degeneration, um, progressing pretty slowly, but he's very, uh, he has a, a pretty limited vision currently, and he makes flutes out there in the shop with me every day, so I hope that that is, um, encouraging to all of you. Uh, I think it's really cool. He's really excited about this opportunity to work with blind and low-sighted people. Um, we have our shop set up with, he, uh, he can see, but not um, clearly, so his vision's quite blurry, I think. And so we have our shop set up with these huge, like, big bright lights everywhere and big magnifying glasses and um, he uses, he's got like, you know, three magnifying glasses on his bench that he uses like all the time and um, we have so many bright lights in the shop that like clamped, clamp lights everywhere that it's like kind of a hazard for everybody, <laughs> but um, he's totally able to like make flutes with me out in the shop and he does so much of it by feel and intuition, and I think that this, I think that this kind of woodworking is something that's actually very accessible for people who have low vision or who don't have any vision. Uh, I don't currently know of anybody who's blind that makes flutes, but I do know a number of blind flute players. Um, that's completely accessible. And um, I just think that this is going to be a really, really rewarding project. Um, I really, uh, I really hope that all the um, lengthy videos that I make are are useful. And I'm also very excited to learn uh, and have feedback about how I could make them more accessible or how I could use my language in a more correct way. Um, I haven't done much work with blind people or low-sighted people, so I'm really excited about this and I hope that you guys are excited to uh, get your hands dirty and make some flutes and get dusty and learn how to play them too. <laughs> I hope you enjoy this. Thank you. heard in my intro video is one of our pre-tuned flute kits in the key of A. This flute is still square. It's tuned already, but it's a un unvarnished uh, western red cedar. All of the flute kits provided are made out of western red cedar. Um, and it's, it's essentially a square flute that needs to be rounded over, sanded, and varnished. And this is what you'll be doing in your project. We provided your group with three different keys of pre-tuned flute making kits. The key of A, which is the highest in pitch, the key of G, which is a little bit lower than the A, and the key of F sharp, which is the lowest in pitch. If you line them all up, you can feel the difference right away. The A is smaller uh, in length, and the fingering holes are um, 
higher up on the flute and closer together. Uh, as flutes get deeper in pitch, they get longer and the fingering holes move further down on the body of the flute. This means that a flute in the key of A will be a little bit easier for people to play if they have uh, small hands or have trouble reaching the fingering hole stretch on the lower keys. I'm going to talk a little bit about shaping the flute. I believe that shaping the flute is a very tactile process. Uh, it certainly doesn't hurt to have vision, but I use my hands a lot to feel what I'm doing, and I think that this is a very accessible project for people who are low sighted or blind. I'm going to describe some of the parts of the flute so that you have a better idea of what we're working with. If you hold the flute so that the big round bore is at the bottom and the small hole, the mouth hole, is at the top, and you feel down the flute, there are two square holes. This I have a flute that I'm going to remove the block of, on the flute so that it's at this point not going to be playable, but I want you to get a feel for what this area is. So with the blowhole facing up, if you feel down the flute, there are two rectangular holes on the flute. These are called thipple holes. And the flat area that these holes are on is called the deck of the flute. And this is an area that remains flat when the flute is finished. So this is an area that you're not going to round over. And the reason for that is that if you feel for your if you feel your block, that's the piece that ties onto the top of the flute. It has a groove in the bottom of it. They all have different shapes. This one in, that I'm holding is in the shape of a bear, but the shape of them isn't really important. The, the groove in the bottom is the crucial part of this that makes the instrument play. So when you place the block on the flute, it will completely cover the square hole that's closest to your mouth and it will come right up to the edge, the top edge of the second square hole. And what it does is the groove, the, when you blow into the blow hole of the flute, the air comes through up through the first thipple hole, the one closest to your mouth. It channel, channels through the bottom of the block and it blows across the second hole. This is really similar to blowing across a bottle. It's essentially making a vibration inside of the flute. Um, air does not actually travel through that big long bore of the flute. It goes across the it goes across the surface of the um, thipple. There's a breaking edge there, a rather sharp pointed edge at the bottom side of the thipple that breaks the air. And when you place your fingers on the fingering holes, you're changing the volume of the inside of the flute, kind of like if you're going to add water to the bottle that you're blowing across, how it would change the pitch. So understanding that, uh, now you can see that you have to leave that little area where the block sits, the deck of the flute, flat. Because if the block is not sitting flat on there, it can't channel the air properly. It's a very common mistake that people make. Um, a lot of times, if you get quite excited about carving your flute and you carve it a little too fast, um, you might accidentally round over this part of the flute. And it can be fixed to some degree, but it's a good idea just to know about it so you don't have to fix it. <laughs> the next thing that's important to keep in mind is that we don't want to remove too much wood over the holes. So the way we do that is that when we're carving the flute, and I'm not sure what tools you'll be using to carve the flute with, um, when I teach flute making, I usually recommend using something like a rasp or my favorite would be a small hand plane. 
So you'll take the hand plane or the rasp and you'll run it along the corners of the flute, the square corners, and you're always going to be taking them and shaving down towards the foot of the flute. And I start carving from the just underneath the thipple holes. In other words, I'm not starting at the mouth end of the flute and running the full length down. I'm starting below that deck area and I'm running to the foot of the flute. And then when I want to shape the mouth end of the flute, I turn the flute the other direction so the blowhole is facing away from me and I shave up towards the the end of that um, from the top of the fit bowl, which is now upside down towards the blowhole and that's how I get a nice taper on the flute. You can feel from the flute that I included which is one of our finished flutes that they have a that they have a section in the, where the block sits, where actually all four uh, sides of the flute remain flat. And you can round over the other sides if you want, but this is the way that I like them to look. It, it's a pretty, it's a pretty nice um, sort of um, symmetrical kind of look to it. Um, and I, th I just think they look really nice and there's no point in rounding over those sections anyhow. So as you're carving, one thing that can be really helpful to do is to, you're continuing to round over the flute by every time there's a, I'm going to say like a corner, a sharp edge, you're going to take the plane and you're going to run it across that. And as you flatten that edge, you make two more. And you continue to do this as you can kind of imagine until the flute is pretty close to being round. It's not going to feel um, smooth when you're finished using the plane because the plane is just a really rough way to get the shape of the flute. And what you're going to do is you're going to continue to feel the wall thickness of the flute at the foot so you'll just use your fingers and pinch and you'll, you can spin the flute and you can kind of feel that you're getting an even wall thickness there. This will actually happen pretty naturally um, as you kind of rotate the flute as you're carving it. So you'll shave one corner down and then turn the flute and shave the next corner down and then turn the flute and shave the next corner and then the last corner and then you continue to shave a little more and a little more and you feel with your fingers at the end to make sure that you're not getting the flute too thin. You can feel the one that I included. This is kind of a, a minimal thickness. It may be a good idea to keep the, the wall thickness a little thicker on the kit than I do on the finished flutes. Um, a lot of people keep their kits a little more square than the way that I shape them. Um, when I shape flutes, I'm doing it on a lathe and I have a lot more control over how symmetrical everything is coming out because it's spinning the flute and I'm using a really sharp gouge to uh, peel wood away in a very precise way so I can get them down to pretty, pretty thin very easily. But you can tell with this wood because it's so soft that you wouldn't want to make it too thin because it'll actually be able to squeeze and flex the wood if you make it too thin. You're gonna do the same thing with the mouth end of the flute, uh, except that you're going to carve a steeper angle on the mouth end, if that makes sense. So you can kind of feel that the mouth end of our flutes is pretty tapered, kind of like a pencil. So I'm not, it's not pointy at the end, but it's, it's, it does go down into a bit of a point. And so you're going to take the shaping tool that you're using and you're going to hold the flute. I would recommend maybe holding, holding it under your, holding 
one end of it under your arm kind of and bracing it against a table or something so that you have leverage and then you're going to just shave towards the blow hole end of the flute and you can t you can make multiple passes over the same area until you get enough stock removed um, another thing to consider when you're carving this part of the flute is that there is a chamber inside of this part of the flute and I've included a cutaway of a flute so you can feel that there's a chamber called it's called the slow air chamber and it's the same bore diameter as the large bore diameter at the end of the flute so the blowhole will lead into that and there's a bit of stock about two and a half inches or so of stock at the end of the flute that the blowhole goes through before it opens up into that lo longer chamber. So you do have to be kind of careful to not make a breakthrough in this area. It's not the good kind of breakthrough <laughs> um, where you shave so much away that you go right through to that chamber and open up a hole in the flute because then we'll have to fix it for you and it's hard. <laughs> So those are some tips I have for shaping the flute. Um, I'll also talk about sandpaper and how to hold the sandpaper because that's a really important part of shaping the flute. When you get your kit to a point where it's the shape you want it to be, so it's, it's going to feel rough but it's rounded over and you feel like it's done being shaped. You're going to move to a really coarse grit of sandpaper. You're going to move to 60 grit sandpaper. And the sandpaper will continue to shape the flute. It's very aggressive and it will remove a lot of stock. So everything that feels like kind of angular or like gouge on the flute is going to get is going to get knocked down by this really coarse grit of sandpaper. You're going to take the, the sandpaper and, of course, I didn't bring a sample of sandpaper home with me so I could show you, but you are going to cup it in your hand. I'm going to demonstrate this with a, just a piece of paper so that whoever is helping guide you through this process can, can demonstrate what I'm showing but you're going to use the the area from your thumb to your index finger this kind of crook of your finger to cup the sandpaper and then i like to fold the sandpaper so that both of the sides that are out are rough and there's you, it, it, the, the, one of the reasons for doing that is that it helps it to not slip out of your hand so you have some something to grab onto. So you cup the sandpaper like this. This isn't sandpaper so it doesn't work well. You can feel that you're making a crook for the flute to fit really nicely into and you're kind of holding on to this sandpaper with your with your um, fingers like you can cup it and then you can curl the tips of your fingers over the sandpaper I'm gonna show this so Emily can help everybody get this hand position right um, this is a really I feel like this is a really important part of sanding flutes and uh, I see a lot of people struggle with how to hold the sandpaper. You would think that that would be a, not that complicated of a thing, but it can be really, really frustrating to hand sand if you're not holding the sandpaper right because it'll keep falling out of your hands and it just feels like really frustrating. So. If you get this cupping technique right, you can grip the flute and then you can stand up and down with the grain of the flute. You're not going to go in circles around the flute because that'll leave all these big nasty scratches that you'll be able to feel and it will not be nice. So you're cupping and you're going to 
aggressively like go up and down the flute and you're gonna push hard against it and you're gonna anchor the flute against your body and you're gonna sand until the flute feels round and all those gouges feel like they've gone away and you're gonna do the same thing for the mouth end. When you're using 60 grit sandpaper, you still need to be careful to not round over the deck because it's sharp enough that you can, you can actually still round over the deck of the flute and you really don't wanna do that. When you're finished with 60 grit sandpaper, the flute is, should be completely shaped. You're not gonna use the other grits of sandpaper to shape the flute. So you should have the flute rounded over and all the gouges should be smoothed out. The flute's still gonna feel rough because you just sanded it with a very coarse grit of sandpaper. But what you're going to do next is you're gonna move through each grit of sandpaper and it's gonna remove the scratches from the last grit until you get to 220 grit, which is a fairly fine grit of sandpaper. And it, the flute at this point is gonna feel velvety smooth and it's going to be really, really nice to feel. <clears throat> this is the last grit before you're finished. And sanding is a really physical process. So it, it can take some time and you might sweat a little bit and it's really, really dusty, <laughs> but um, the end result will be a nice, smooth, uniform, shaped flute. So I'm not sure whether you're going to be varnishing your flutes or whether someone else is going to be varnishing them for you, but I'll describe a little bit what the varnishing process is like. Um, when we varnish our flutes, we use a tube of varnish, which is like a big PVC tube with a cone on the end. Um, and it's full of oil-based polyurethane varnish and we'll take a flute and we'll put a lag bolt in, in the blowhole and then we'll completely dunk the whole thing in varnish and pull it out and all the varnish will run off. And then we take a swab, um, which is actually, the swab that we use is actually like a modified shotgun swab. It turns out that flutes and shotguns are about the same <laughs> diameter bore. Um, and we use a, a shop paper towel uh, to swab out the varnish from the inside. And then we take a shop paper towel folded up and we wipe the varnish in the direction of the grain of the flute. And the goal is to get all of the excess varnish off of the outside of the flute so that there aren't big thick spots of varnish and all the varnish is fairly uniform on the outside. Another way to varnish a flute, which may be the method that your group will use, is to um, rub varnish on the outside of the flute. And you, you could use, uh, our flutes are sealed inside already, so you could use any kind of varnish. You could use, you know, polyurethane varnish like we use, or you could use... Um, tongue oil or any kind of hand rubbed oil finish. Um, I actually don't have very much experience using hand rubbed oil finish, but it it is it, it creates a very um, lustrous, uh, smooth, silky finish. So it's a really nice kind of um, finish and uh, hopefully whoever is going to help you apply the finish has more knowledge about how to apply that to a flute than I do but I think it involves a lot of polishing it into the surface of the flute and that's probably a very tedious but enjoyable process. The end result will be a flute that's uh, protected from moisture, uh, both moisture from your environment that you're in and moisture from the humidity from your breath. So I hope that was a helpful uh, bunch of words that I had about how to um, shape one of our kits. I've probably left crucial information out, but it's really hard to, to think of all the things that I need to remember to tell people when I'm 
got a camera pointed at me. So uh, I hope that that is helpful information and I'm really, really excited to be um, part of this process, even if my part of this process is just to provide the, the kits. Um, I always feel like our flute kits are like a collaboration between me and whoever is shaping them. And I especially love when we get to share the flute kits with groups. Um, we've, we've shared with all kinds of groups at this point. Um, we've had a lot of school projects, some public schools, some tribal schools. We've had tribal community building projects that w that are with all ages of tribal members. Um, those are really wonderful and I've actually taught a few of those in person. And we've um, had Boy Scout groups work with our kids and um, prisoners and people who are recovering from addiction and people who are suffering from PTSD, veterans and uh, other people who are suffering. So this is, this is a really special opportunity to get to make an instrument that you're also going to get to own and learn to play and have forever. And I think that the act of making it yourself and shaping it and really getting to know your flute will bond you to it. And I think this is probably my favorite part of my job is to, to get to provide this instrument to people. And uh, it's really special and I'm really grateful to be part of it. <laughs>